Um, I invite you to open up. Uh, we're going we're gonna to spend some time in Ephesians, specifically Ephesians 3, verse 16 to 19. This is probably one of my favorite verses in Scripture. And so um, we're going to go have a look at it, pull out some things that I feel like God wants to say to us as a church. So um, open up your Bibles, your apps. Let's dive in. Ephesians 3, verse 16 to 19. It says the following from the NIV. I pray that out of His glorious riches, He may strengthen you with power through His Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be full to the measure of all the fullness of God. So the big idea that I want us to walk away from this morning is the following. A revelation of His great love empowers us through faith to live in the fullness of God. And when we grasp God's four-dimensional love for us, we cannot live ordinary lives. So we see Paul running to the Ephesians. There's two prayers and two outcomes. And we're going to quickly unpack that, um, starting with Paul's first prayer in verse 16. It says, I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being. And in the outcome, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Now, when I read Scripture, I love to ask questions because I have a lot of questions. I don't know about you, but when you read it, it often leaves me with more questions than answers. Anyone can relate to that? A few honest people. So, I like to ask the following questions. What? Where? How? Why? Who? And then when? And I like color because... It helps me to keep my thoughts together, so I've got highlighters, and I scribble, and I make notes, because um, that's how I think. It might be different for you, but I invite you that over this holiday and festive season, that you bring out some colors and highlighters, and stay in God's Word, because it's rich. So, if we look at the first prayer that Paul prayed, I want to try and answer the question, what? What is Paul praying for? He's praying for a strengthening and an empowering. Now, let me ask you, this time of the year, how many of you can do with a little bit of strength, a little bit of encouragement, a little bit of oomph, maybe feeling a little bit dry, empty, like crawling towards the end of this year? This word is for you. Where do we find the strengthening? It says, out of His glorious riches. And with what? Does he want to strengthen us with his power? How is he going to do it? Through his spirit? And where is this going to find traction in our life? In your inner being. And who is being mentioned here? So I is obviously Paul. He's writing. Me is us. Spirit means the spirit of God. It's quite easy so far, right? You guys following? Then what is he praying for? The outcome is so that... Christ may dwell, that Christ may make his home and be one with us, not visiting us, but staying with us, remaining and abiding. And where does this take place? In our hearts. How does this happen? Through faith. And who is mentioned here? Christ. And then what I like to do when I see your or you, I like to put my name there because it makes it just a little bit more personal. So, so that Christ may, del, may dwell in Luther's heart through faith. All of a sudden it's like, whoa, he's talking to me? He's not talking about someone else, he's talking to me. Wow, he's got a word for me. To so make it personal. Again, the big truth, a revelation of his great love empowers you and me through faith to live in the fullness of God always wanted to do that. Prayer 2. Going to prayer 2. For what is Paul praying for? 
He's praying that we would have a power and that we would be able to grasp and to know. What does He want us to know? Or where do we find this power and this grasping and knowing? It's in His love. How do we do this? Together with all God's holy people. I realize <laughs> life is so much better together than on your own. There's things that God is going to show you on your own, but there's so much more He wants to show you with God's people. Yeah. Being together, being rooted, established. He wants us to be established in what? His four-dimensional love. There's a love that is so high, so wide, so long and deep. I don't know if you can remember, we used to sing this song in school. Bruce, you remember? The love of Jesus. It's so wonderful, the love of Jesus. It's so wonderful, the love of Jesus. It's so wonderful, oh, wonderful love. So high, can't get over it. So low, you can't get under it. So wide, you can't get around it. Oh, wonderful love. Not bad. I knew not then what I know now. I now know that in my deepest and worst times of my life, God's love is the same as when I'm at my very best, and I know that He loved me before creation and will love me forever and evermore. In the same way that God is outside of time, He sees the past, the present, and the future, I feel like He loves us like that. He loved us before we even knew Him. It says before creation, he made everything that we see and enjoy for us to enjoy out of a place of love. And therefore, that love will never run dry for you and me. It doesn't matter what we do. It stretches all into eternity and beyond. There is a wonderful mystery about this four-dimensional, mysterious, great love of God for you and me. And it's going to take us all of eternity to not figure it out. That's a good thing. Can you imagine worshiping something or someone that you know fully and comprehend? We're never going to be bored. We're never going to grab for our screens or want to be entertained by some Netflix series. Because we're going to stand in awe and we're going to see face to face and behold who this God is that loves us the way that he does. Outcome two. Still in prayer number two, Paul prays. Why does he pray what he prays? He prays so that you and I may be filled. With what? All the fullness of God. Everything there is for you and me. Who is made mentioned here? God. When we grasp, here's another truth. When we grasp God's four-dimensional love for you and me, we cannot live ordinary lives. So now we're going to go a little bit deeper. Stage two, level two. That's not, that's not a good example. <laughs> Level to you, right? Um, and we're going to unpack this part of Paul's prayer. Now, before we do that, Paul talks about something that happens within us that leads to a great strength and an empowering by spirit in our inner being. And it comes from or out of his glorious riches. Now, I've often looked at this and I've wondered, what is this glorious riches? sounds so like out there. In order to understand this, we are going to find some other scriptures that reference and makes mention of this. Now, if we look at Ephesians, there's some words that Paul throws out. He talks about the marvelous plan of God, the majestic, mysterious, best-kept secret that's been hidden for ages. And all of a sudden, this is made known, and it's got something to do about the salvation story that's not just for us, but for the Gentiles. And somehow he includes you and I in it. We don't quite know what that looks like, how does it work, but there's this marvelous, mysterious secret kept hidden for ages that is now being revealed. It's God's master plan, and it's to save all mankind, even the Gentiles through the church, his people. And this requires faith in approaching God, and with it comes a freedom and a great confidence. So Paul says, don't be too much bothered if I suffer for a while, or like my friend would often say, everybody, calm down. It's going to be okay. 
because there's a marvelous mystery busy unfolding, and of this I have been made a servant. So what is this glorious riches? When I heard this, I had this picture of a lantern, like approaching this cave and wanting to get in, trying to find the right words to say so the cave can open, and then, and then you all struck by all these treasures, all these things that God has for us. It's a little bit like that, but way better. So Ephesians 3 verse 8 says the following, Although I am less than the least of all the Lord's people, this grace was given me to preach to the Gentiles the boundless riches of Christ. Ephesians 1 verse 18 says, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know this hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people. It is still rather mysterious, this glorious countless riches, but we're going to come back to it. It gets better. How is this going to happen? This is going to happen through God's Spirit. Romans 8 verse 16 says, The Spirit Himself testifies with our spirit that we are His children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in His sufferings in order that we may also share in His glory. Let's ask a question. Where? Where does this take place? This t- takes place in our inner being. What, to- what Paul talks about is something very personal, very intimate, very deep, and very real. Something that is not taught, but it's caught. Something that gets put within us, not on us. In other words, not something that we can take off. Not something we wear comfortable like our favorite jacket or shirt but something you and I are. Not something we subscribe to or feel like or scroll through or like or give a thumbs up, but something from within that is authentic and intimate. Not something we hear about, but a revelation that resonates within our being. What is the purpose of this? The purpose is so that Christ may dwell. I like that word. In fact, I think there's a magazine called Dwell. It talks about how to make your home all lovely. Now, when I think of the word dwelling, I realize my in-laws are going to come visit me now over the holiday festive season, and they were going to come for quite some time, and then it got shortened because uh, they've got some operations to tend to, so they have to leave again early. So we were going to put them up somewhere else, Good for them and for us, a bit of space. But I've now been told that they're actually going to move in, right? So th- there's a difference when someone visits you versus moving in and staying with you. I'm not saying anything about that. I don't know. There's a big difference. Paul's desire is that Christ and the reality that he wants to move in and not just visit from time to time. It's very obvious. Where does he want to move in and dwell? In your heart. You see, the reason why he wants your heart, it's the engine of who you are. It's your soul center. It's who we are. It's where dreams and desires originate from. Where Whoever resides there, makes his or home there, will define who you are and what you love and live for. So be careful who you invite. Proverbs 4 verse 23 says, Above all else, guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. Graham Cook has got a podcast called Brilliant Perspectives, and I want you to listen to what he says from God's perspective to you and me. He says the following, We, meaning God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, are making you like us, and we are amazing. When we live our lives fully aware of Jesus in us, walking and talking with God, just as Jesus adored walking and talking with His Father during His time on earth, there is no way that we can live an ordinary life. How could we? How could we be in a relationship with someone as beautiful as the Father, someone as glorious as Jesus, and someone as joyful and powerful 
as the Holy Spirit. They living with us and through us. How then can we be dull and ordinary? I don't think it's possible. You see, the cross didn't upgrade our relationship with God. It created an entirely new relationship with the one God always desired from the beginning, where he was no longer just visiting people, but he could live inside of them. John 17 verse 23 says, I in them and you in me, that they may be made perfect in one, that the world may know that you have sent me and loved them, that you have sent me and loved them as you have loved me. I love that we are God's habitation, and the Father loves you with the same love that he has for Jesus. And Jesus loves you with the same passion he has for the Father. Every day he wants to astonish us with that love. Every morning he's coming and saying, Megan, I love you. I get to be, I love what I get to be for you this day. Marlene, you are my beloved. You are my child and you are my friend. I adore being relentless in my love for you. I revel in sharing my joy so that you can be strengthened. Tristan, I smile when you encounter me. A peace that bypasses your understanding and goes straight to how magnificent I am for you. I want you to be amazed at how I never ever change. I'm delighted in who you are today and I'm excited, Jess, about what you're becoming tomorrow. How will this happen? Through faith, we see in Hebrews 11, verse 1, faith is confidence of what we hope for and an assurance about what we do not see. You see, this life of Christianity is one of faith, where what God says to us matters most, where we get shaped by who we worship and who we listen to. Adrian was saying this morning, may God give us eyes to see him and ears to hear him. That's what we get invited to. Relationship. Walking with God. Talking. Lingering in his presence. So when we grasp God's four-dimensional love for us, we cannot live ordinary lives. For what? Paul is praying that we would have power to grasp and to know. You see, there's a peace that's so powerful when we know what Paul's talking about. Philippians 4 verse 7 says, And the peace of God which transcends all understandings will guard your hearts. Why your heart? Because it's the wellspring of life and your mind's in Christ Jesus. You see, knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. I have this picture of this hot air balloon. Look at what I know. Just pop it and or you can have this strong, solid like a rock, unwavering, unmoving because of what he says, not because of what I know. 1 Corinthians 8 verse 1 to 3 says, Now about food sacrificed to idols, we know that we all possess this knowledge, but knowledge puffs up while love builds up. Those who think they know something do not yet know as they ought to know, but whoever loves God is known by God. You see, we cannot love or know God once we realize how much He loves us. It says He loved us first, before we even knew Him, when we weren't even looking for Him. <laughs> His eyes was on us. He came for us. It's two very different things, knowledge and knowing. Moving on swiftly. Where is Paul pointing us towards His love? What kind of a love is this? I want to read you something, but I want you to close your eyes for a minute. Just imagine the Father and Jesus standing about a meter apart, talking to each other. Animated, smiling, laughing, loving at each other. And then imagine yourself right in the middle of them, feeling the vibration of their voices in your ears. Feeling the same things in your heart that they're feeling in their hearts about each other. That's the love that you're included in. You're included in the unity that's in the Godhead. And God will never separate you from their presence with each other. You are totally included in that. 
So we are learning, I think, to stand in their love that was present before creation existed. And then the Holy Spirit, imagine him standing behind you with his hands on your shoulders. So you can't move. You can't get out of there. You're in there. You're joyfully stuck there because he's helping you to remain, to stay and to dwell in that place and to encourage you that what they're saying is true and to guide you into all that truth in them. In that place of increasing love, you are meant to live and move and have your being. That's what it means to abide in his love, to stay, to remain in that beautiful space between the Father and the Son, seeing as they see, hearing how they think, listening to the language that they use as they talk to each other about each other and as they talk to each other about you. Beautiful. Can you, can you see that? Can you imagine that? <laughs> I think we have a wrong perception of who we are and we often look at ourselves through people's eyes. We need to spend a lot more time thinking what does God think of us. And when we live in this space, we'll live differently. How does this happen? Together with all God's holy people. Ephesians 3 verse 10 says, His intent was that now through the church, what is church without people? It's just a building. Through you and me. The manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms by being rooted, established in this great immeasurable realm. Who does God use? He uses you and me. Now, when I heard the Lord's holy people, I was a little bit like, holy. I mean, I picture these priests swinging those, you know, with the, with the things, the, what's it, the gowns. And I was like, I, I can't really relate. But I realize, again, I'm looking at myself, not the way God looks at us. When God sees us, you and me, if we put our faith in him, we are holy. Because holiness is not something we do. It's something we are because of what God has done. So scripture talks about be holy. It doesn't say go do some holy things. We are holy because of who Jesus is in us. So the outcome of Paul's prayer is that you and I may be filled. You know, our cause shows us when we are empty. Oh, I've got to fill up again. How much is it going to cost this time? Our cell phone shows us low power mode. We need to go plug in. How do you and I fill up? With what? The fullness of God. So we're going to land. Last stretch. We're coming in for a landing. We're going to circle back to the very, very first verse. And I pray that God would show us what this glorious riches are. In Ephesians 3 and 8, remember it said, there's this boundless riches of Christ, Ephesians 1.18, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people. I feel like I want to play music. Da, 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 da. Colossians 1 verse 26. Here it is. Boom. Let's read it. The mystery that has been kept hidden for ages and generations but is now disclosed to the Lord's people. To them God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is what? Christ in you. <laughs> Christ in you, the hope of glory. This mysterious plan, this marvelous invitation, this love that's four-dimensional, there's no height depth, width, or length. We cannot comprehend it. We can wonderfully be lost in it. He's in Jesus, and he chooses to put that in you and me. It's not something that we need to go find. It's not something we need to achieve. He puts Jesus in you and me. We have access to the greatest resource that's how you get strengthened. That's how you are empowered. That's how you make sense of life. 
that he would put his beloved son and all the love that he has for you and me in us. He wants to dwell in us. He wants to live and move and have his being in you and me. That's why we can't live ordinary, boring lives. That's why the world is going to be set ablaze. That's how God is going to fill the earth through this knowledge, this mystery in you and me, this love that knows no end. Amen. Thank you.